Today we're reading from Dar David Enrich's book, Dark Towers, Deutsche Bank, Donald Trump, and an Epic Trail of Destruction. This is from Chapter 10. It's titled The Mar-a-Lago Prize. In 1905, a German immigrant living in the Bronx set up a small barber shop on the ground floor of a newly constructed building at 60 Wall Street in the heart of Manhattan's booming financial district. In an era before skyscrapers, the 25-story L-shaped tower was a landmark its gargoyle guarded roof visible from the nearby waterfront. The barber shop thrived, offering shaves and trims to a procession of bankers, stock exchange traders, lawyers, and office workers. The barber's name was Frederick Trump. The same year that he opened the shop, his wife gave birth to a boy named Fred. Many years passed, and the barber shop closed, and the old 60 Wall Street gave way to, in 1989 to a new, a new 60 Wall Street, a 47-story tower topped with a distinctive pyramid roof. For a time, it was home to J.P. Morgan and Company. Then the bank left, and in 2005, Deutsche Bank started relocating its American staff, displaced ever since 9-11, to its new home at 60 Wall Street. And so Frederick Trump's grandson, born to Fred's wife in 1946, became an occasional visitor to the site of his grandfather's old barber shop. Deutsche's relationship with Donald Trump had only deepened since Mike Offit left. Justice Justin Kennedy, this is the son of uh, uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy, Justin Kennedy, now a managing director, had become a key point contact for Trump and helped chaperone large real estate deals for him through the bank. Kennedy's role was to find customers to buy portions of loans after Deutsche dispensed the money, a process that allowed Deutsche Bank to make larger loans than it otherwise could have. Kennedy sometimes sat with Trump in his luxury box at the U.S. Open Tennis Tournament or at Manhattan nightclubs, where Trump would park himself at a table in the corner facing outward, holding court like a mafia don. Now, with Kennedy's encouragement, Deutsche hurried along a Henry Villard-like path. In 2000, the bank had plunked down another $150 million to be used for the renovations of Trump's building at 40 Wall Street. The next year, Deutsche agreed to extend Trump a mortgage worth more than $900 million, at the time the largest ever on a, on a single property, so he could buy the General Motors building on the southeastern corner of New York's Central Park. Trump already owned half of the 50-story building. He wanted the rest. And in 2002, Deutsche agreed to refinance about $70 million that he owed on some of his Atlantic City casinos. Those loans came out of Deutsche's commercial real estate division, which Kennedy was helping to run. Not everyone was enamored with Trump. Seth Waugh, W-A-U-G-H, one of Edson's many Merrill Lynch recruits and the head of Deutsche's American operations, learned around 2001 that the bank was planning to lend Trump about $500 million to use as he wished, basically an unrestricted cash infusion to stabilize the developer's fly flagging finances. Waugh had previously witnessed up close the carnage that Trump could inflict on imprudent financial institutions. At Merrill, Edison had assigned him the task of mopping up after Trump defaulted on nearly $700 million of bonds that Merrill had helped sell for his Taj Mahal casino in Atlantic City. Waugh was in no hurry to repeat the experience at Deutsche. He voiced strong objections to the proposed new loan to Trump, in which Trump would not have had to put up any hard assets as collateral. And the deal soon died. Yet Deutsche's broader Trump relationship rumbled on. In 2003, another arm of Deutsche, focused on helping companies raise money by selling stocks and bonds to investors, agreed to work with Trump. The point man on this part of the relationship was Richard Byrne, another Merrill veteran who had been involved in the Taj Mahal debacle. Byrne had helped sell the ill-fated Taj bonds to investors. Now Trump hired Byrne's group at Deutsche to issue bonds for his troubled Trump Hotel and Casino Resorts. Byrne knew this would be an uphill battle. Not only had Trump defaulted in the past, but he also had recently been taunting investors that he might stop paying back another outsta other outstanding bonds. Waugh didn't, want, didn't warn Byrne about the recently rejected $500 million loan, and so Byrne organized a roadshow for Trump to meet with and try to win over big institutional investors. He escorted Trump to meetings all over New York and Boston. At every stop, boardrooms and auditoriums were jammed with traders, fund managers, senior executives, and secretaries curious to see the Donald show. And Trump didn't disappoint. He rocked, he rolled, and he delivered wildly optimistic and inconsistent financial projections.
Afterward, Trump called Byrne to ask how much money they'd raised. The answer, alas, was virtually zero. Byrne braced for an explosion as he explained to Trump that though he'd been treated like a celebrity, nobody trusted him with their money. Trump took the rejection in stride. Let me talk to your salespeople, he requested. Byrne agreed, and Trump came to deliver a pep talk. Fellas, I know this isn't the easiest thing you've all had to sell, he acknowledged, but if you get this done, you'll all be my guests at Mar-a-Lago. Trump was always good at pushing an audience's buttons. A weekend with Trump at Mar-a-Lago, bragging rights that not even money could buy, and this new incentive did the trick. The salesman worked the phones, cast a wider net for more clients, and managed to sell an impressive $485 million of junk bonds, albeit at a high interest rate that reflected investors' fears that Trump might default. The book Dark Towers by David Enrich.